Good morning, Stonehills. Great to see you guys here this morning. Hopefully, you are enjoying your summer and uh, just really relishing the time that we have before fall hits and school starts back up. And uh, we're really glad you're here today. We'd love for you guys to go ahead and take your Bibles out and turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Uh, we're in the series called Life Skills, and we're going we're gonna to dig down into Proverbs 4 in just a moment. But before we get there, I want to share some Big and exciting news, kind of what's happening here at Stonehill Church. A lot of things that we're going to be sharing with you in the next couple months, but today something specific. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but at the end of August, beginning of September, Stonehill will be turning two years old, and I cannot believe all that God has been doing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty exciting. And so, I mean, I look back at just this past year and to see what God has already done this year, 2018. Like, for instance, this year we've already seen 61 people give their lives to Jesus Christ for the very first time. And so that's something to celebrate right there, guys. I think we can celebrate that together. Um, actually, 62, somebody gave their life to Christ in the first service today. And so that's really, really cool. Um, as we look at the attendance of this past, this June 2018, compared to the June of 2017, our church has grown 24% since year to year uh, comparison. So that's pretty cool number wise. And then um, at the springtime before summer hit, you know, summer hits and people go on vacation and camping and those types of things. But before spring hit, we were averaging around 1,133 people per Sunday uh, in two services. And you guys were here, you remember, it's not much different than what today is, but the chairs were going all the way to the back. Um, the kids' classrooms were packed, um, the hallways were nuts. And, you know, the hallways are pretty tight here already, um, and so during the wintertime, we can't really use the outside as much, and the parking lot was full, and I believe that we're going to see in the next month or two, we're going to start seeing people kind of coming back from vacation and being here more consistently, and I believe that in the fall, we're going to hit over 1,200, 1,300 people, and that is just amazing, and again, it's not about the numbers, about the people, cause, but each person represents a story, a God story. And so we want to make sure that everybody has room. And so we believe that we're going to continue to grow. I believe that you're going to continue to invite your friends and your family um, and your coworkers and your neighbors. I believe that our church is going to continue to grow. So because of that, as a church, we have to be good stewards of that and make sure that we provide enough seats and, and spaces for people to come to hear about the good news. And so we're excited about the growth. And so because of that... As we turn two, we're going to go to three. Okay, as we turn two, we're going to three. That's three services. We're going to start on September 23rd, and we can't wait because we believe that there are more people that need a great church home, and so we're excited about that. Now, you might have some questions. Is it all the services going to be on Sunday morning? Are they going to be Saturday night? Well, we're going to have them on Sunday morning because we can't do a Saturday night service here, so that's, that answers that. The question would be is, when are the service times? Well, we've got some ideas, but we're going to try to nail those out. We're going to continue to pray through that this week and the next week and let you guys know uh, pretty soon. And so there might be all kinds of other questions, um, but here's what I know is that we have to do all that we can do to make sure there's enough room for people to come hear about Jesus and to grow in their faith. And so I was, uh, I was listening to a friend this week, and he's a pastor. He planted a church in, in the, Boise, the Boise Bench, and he gave us a statistic, some of these pastors, he gave us a statistic this week. He was researching it through the Pew Research Company and also U.S. Census. And what he found out is that right now in the Treasure Valley, there are only 12% of the people in this community that are actively part of a gospel teaching church. What do you guys think about that? Now, there's a lot of other people that are, that are call themselves Christians or, or maybe even are Christians, but that aren't actively involved in the body of Christ, the church. And so as I began to think about that and that statistic, I began to think about, we've got a lot to do. There's 88% of our valley that are not active in worshiping God together in a church, in a church body. And so we have a lot of opportunity and a lot of potential to see people come to know 
Jesus Christ. And so we can't wait to continue to reach out and reach them um, for the Lord. And we believe this, that Stonehill, we believe that uh, Jesus changes lives. We believe it, like with all our heart. That's why we started Stonehill almost two years ago. That's why we do what we do. That's why we get up early and set up. That's why we, we have children's ministries. That's why we try to have a great first impressions ministry. That's why we try to love and encourage one another because we believe that Jesus changes lives. And so there are people that need to know him. And so we're going to have three services. And we're going to encourage you to invite and encourage you to continue to pour into the lives of the people that God places you around every single day. And with three services, there becomes more opportunity to serve, to serve. Now, many of you are already serving, and so that's awesome. You're serving on the weekends. You're serving part of a ministry at Stonehill Church. But we're going to ask you, if you're not part of, if you are part of Stonehill Church, you call this your home, but you're not actively involved in a ministry to get in the game, to get plugged in, to be part of what we do. It's so much fun, and it's it's an awesome opportunity to see lives change. And so even today, we have a handout in your bulletin. We'd love for you to pull that out. If you're not involved, we would love for you to take that handout, fill out the information. If you want to get involved in ministry, you already know a ministry you wouldn't want involved, to be involved in, mark that box. Or you can let us know if you want us to help you find a ministry. You can check the box, help me, and we'll be like your concierge, and we'll come and, and put you, get you in the right ministry that you're passionate about and you want to serve in. And the cool thing about the ministries at our church is we are, most of them are on rotation basis, and we don't want to burn anybody out, but we want everybody involved. I'd rather have everybody doing a little bit of the work than a few people doing a lot of the work, and so that's really what the church is all about. And so we're going to be talking about that the next few mo mo uh, months, but if you want uh, to get involved now, you can fill that out, put it in the communication card, um, or I'm sorry, at the offering basket at the end of the service, and we will contact you this week, but I'm excited. I hope you're excited about it. I'm going to ask you to pray about it and ask God to just do a work as we move towards the fall and as people continue to move into this valley. I don't know if you guys know this, but our community is growing, and I haven't seen a ton of new churches pop up. And so part of our job is to make seats, and then we're going to talk about starting new churches and plants and down the future as well, but we're excited about what God is going to do. All right, well, thanks for being here today. We're going to continue on our series of life skills out of Proverbs chapter 4, and today we're going to talk about our hearts. We're going to talk about our hearts. And when we talk about hearts, a lot of times hearts, we have different connotations of it, and we think of different things. We even have sayings that come with hearts, like, bless your heart, or, you know, um, my heart was broken, or, you know, we have all kinds of different sayings that come with heart, but today I want to specifically look at what the Bible says about our hearts. What does God's word say about our hearts? Now, as you're turning to Proverbs chapter 4, uh, verse 23, um, I'm going to tell you the story about me when I was in high school. There was this girl that I had her liked, okay? She, her name was Alicia, and she was cute, and she was funny, and so I kind of began to get around her, and we'd, we'd talk and have some fun, and, and she had mutual friends, we had mutual friends, and and so there was another couple, and then it was, it was us two, and I, I just began to really get to know her and like her, and she began to get my heart, okay? Like, like I, I just really started to like her. Now, up to this point, I had never been broken up with by a girl before. Like, I was kind of like, I had, like, I was in the driver's seat, you know, and I only dated one girl, so, I mean, it wasn't like this big deal, but, like, I, I never had that feeling of like a broken heart, but, but this girl, I'm like, I'm starting to, to like her, and I, I feel like she really likes me, and so it was awesome because um, in Indianapolis, where I grew up, there was a Boys to Men concert coming there on Valentine's night. You know what I'm talking about, guys? I mean, they, you guys don't know what Boys to Men is. There are these guys that sing these songs. They were hard. It was awesome. Anyways, go back and, and listen to it. It's amazing, um, the, like the original boy band. And so anyways, uh, besides Backstreet Boys, but anyways, it was, it was, uh, somebody's like, okay, Beatles, sorry. Um, so it, it was amazing, it was perfect, and so I went, and I bought her ticket, I bought me a ticket, and our friends bought a ticket, we were going to go on a double date, and I'm just, I'm just envisioning this night, that we're sitting there, I'm singing Motown Philly to her, you know, I'm like, it's just going to be amazing, and so um, again, I, I get the courage to go up to her, and I ask her, um, I, I want to ask her to go with me to this date on Valentine's night. So this is kind of a big deal. So I get the courage. I walk up to her, and uh, I'm like, hey, Alicia, how you doing? I have the tickets in my hand. And I'm like, hey, you know what? I think it would be awesome 
would you want to go with me to Boys to Men on Valentine's night? You know, I'm trying to, you know, bust the moves here. On Valentine's night and be my date. And I'm just ready for her to be like, yeah, that'd be awesome. But instead, she gives me the classic. Oh, Doug, that's really sweet. But I think we should just be what? Friends. You guys sound like you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> over here. And so my heart <laughs> was crushed, and it hurt. And I started singing the song Into the Road by Boys and Men. You know, it was like, <laughs> it was perfect. And I was just really down and out and bummed, and I was, my heart was hurting. Now, I was hurt. I mean, let me be really straight here. I was hurt, but I wasn't an idiot. I didn't want to waste my money. So I still went to the concert by myself as a third wheel on Valentine's night to boys to men, okay? You're talking about sad. You guys are supposed to be like, aw. All right, I just lost my man card to every guy here, you know? But that's what happens when it comes to our hearts. You see, when our, when our heart, spiritually, is in the wrong place, we're in the wrong place. The opposite is true, though. When our heart is in the right place, we're in the right place. And Solomon knew this as he talks about this in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. And I want us to read this verse. We're going to read this one verse, and then we're going to unpack it. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says this. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Let me read that again. Above all else, Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And so what I want to do is take this verse, I want to unpack it, and give you three things that we have to understand about our hearts. The first thing is this, is the priority of our heart. The priority of our heart. Look what he says at first. The first three words, he says this, above all else. Now, if you study most other scriptures a lot of them do not start with these words, like above all else, the top priority, the thing that you need to focus on, this is super important. The ESV uses the words with all vigilance. Man, this is a big deal when it comes to our heart. The Bible focuses on the heart so much. The Bible says the heart, the word heart, over 600 times in, in the scriptures. In, nine, in Proverbs alone, there's 97 times that Solomon uses the word heart. And he's telling us that if you want to be wise, you better check your heart. You better watch your heart and prioritize your heart. And when we think of our heart, what do we think of? We usually think of feelings. We think of emotions, we think of passions, and you know, you can look at our greeting cards when you go to Walgreens, and you can see that, right, and you, all the lovey stuff that we see, and that's what we get from the Greek culture. You see, the Greek culture believed in this anthropological dualism, which, which basically meant this, is that there's a war between our heads, the rational part of our body, and our heart, the emotional side, and those two are warring with one another, so in our culture, when we think of heart, we usually think of romantic type things or we think of love or we think of passion or feelings or or drive and yes that is part of it but when we study God's word it's more than just those things you see when the Bible talks about the heart it talks about it in more of a holistic sense like our everything our entire being so as we read through the scriptures, we have to read it through that lens that, that they're not just talking about our feelings and emotions, it's talking about everything. And so we look at the different capacities. First of all, when it comes to the heart, the Bible talks about it being kind of having an intellectual capacity. The Bible says in different places that the heart ponders, that the heart can understand, that the heart considers, has an intellectual capacity. It also has the emotional capacity. It says the heart has joy, the heart has sorrow, the heart can have bitterness, but it also has a volitional capacity. It has intellectual, it has, uh, it has emotional, but it also has a volitional capacity where it says the heart wills, like the heart decides. The heart can move in a direction. Matthew chapter 6 is where your treasure is, there your heart is. Your heart has this volitional capacity to it. And then finally, our hearts have a moral capacity, has a moral compass. The Bible says that the heart can be gentle, the heart can be holy, 
But the Bible also says that the heart at times can be wicked. And Jesus says at times our heart can be deceitful. What I want us to get as we, as we dig down into this is our heart is not just our feelings. It's not just our passions or emotions. Our heart is the engine of every single thing we do. Our heart drives everything we do, good or bad. Our heart has to be the priority of everything we do. Now, for a moment, I want you guys to think about this. In your house, like, is there something that is the priority? When it comes to your kids, do they have something that's priority? Do you have something that's priority? I, I've been thinking about my house, and it's, it's interesting. There's one thing in my house that is the priority almost of everything, okay? Some of you parents will understand what I'm talking about. It's this nasty pink dog right here, okay? Now, I have a picture of it here so you can kind of see. This thing is disgusting, okay? If you were up here and you would see it, it's matted. It's, it's dirty. It looks like it's been run over by a truck five different times. It is, smells a little funny, okay? But it drives every single thing we do at our house at times, okay? My daughter, Hadley, this is her pink puppy pup. That's what she calls it, pink puppy pup. And you better not call it anything else than pink puppy pup because that's pink puppy pup's name. And so we constantly are talking about pink puppy pup in our house. Every morning when we get up, she has to know where pink puppy pup is. Heaven forbid if she places it somewhere and cannot remember where she put it, she freaks out and breaks out into mass hysteria until we find pink puppy pup. Now, she takes after her mom in that area, okay? I mean, it's like this is, this is a big, big deal in our house, this nasty, nasty, dirty stuffed animal. So a couple weeks ago, we went to high school camp, and Hadley was up there with us for a couple days, and so we drove home before we had a go back up for kids camp, and so we drove all the way home, and on the way home, we stopped at the gas station, Stinker gas station, and Donnelly, you know, um, we got some snacks, those types of things, and then we drove home, and so when we get home, Hadley fell asleep, and then she, she woke up, and so when we bring her into her house, we're in another room, and all of a sudden, she is freaking out. We do not know what is happening we thought she got her arm cut off or she hit her head or something drastic happened. So we walk in, Hadley, what is going on? I can't find Pink Puppy Pop. I'm like, what is going I mean, this was crazy. And so we look everywhere. I mean, we weren't even unpacked yet, but we had to find this dang dog and figure out where it was because it was out of control. And so... Finally, we realized, we remember that we stopped at the Stinker gas station in Donnelly, and she had brought it in to the bathroom. And so we realized that we probably left it at the bathroom in Donnelly. So my wife, because she's a loving mom, she calls the gas station up. They had found it. They put it off to the side, and then we went back up to kids' camp. And thank the Lord they still had it, and we were able to get it, and life was back into balance again, okay? I don't even think we've washed the thing since it's been in the bathroom, which is totally disgusting. (laughs) But we love Pink Puppy Puff. (sighs) So here's the thing. That was gross. (laughs) That's her priority, man. Like, everything she does goes back to peak puppy pup. That's the way it has to be when it comes to our hearts. When it comes to allowing God to get our heart and prioritizing above all else, making sure that we put it in the right direction because it affects every single thing we do. We have to prioritize it. Here's the second thing we have to do is we have to protect it. We have to understand the protection of our heart. And so he says this, Solomon says in verse 23, above all else, well, what are we supposed to do? What, what's the priority? What's the biggest thing we're supposed to do? He says, guard your heart. Guard your heart. If you take this word guard back to the actual he- Hebrew, the original Hebrew, it has a f- more forceful meaning than just like guard it, you know, like you're playing basketball, you know, you're guarding it. It means to double guard. To guard the guarding. 
And Solomon is saying your heart is so vital to your walk and to your life that we have to make sure that it is protected. Because if we don't protect it, we lose out. We lose out in life. We lose out in our relationships with God and our relationships with others. And we lose out on the big plans that God has for each one of us. Why? Why do we have to guard it? Why is it that big of a deal? Like, well, because we have an enemy who's ready to attack it, who wants to attack it. You see, 1 Peter 5, 8 says this about Satan. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful, be guarded. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You see, if you don't guard your heart, Satan will get there. If you don't care about your heart, Satan does. And he will do all that he can do to attack it. Because he knows if he gets your heart, if he gets our heart, everything goes from there. So how do we do this? How do we protect our heart? Well, Solomon goes on and he continues to tell us how to protect it. And the first way he tells us is by what we say and what we hear. By what we say and what we hear. He says this, keep your mouth free of adversity. He says, keep corrupt talk far from your lips. You see, we have to watch what we say. DJ talked about our words a couple weeks ago and how powerful they are. They are life-giving or they're death-dealing. But it's even bigger than just what we say. It's sometimes to who, what we, to who we say it to. It's also the words that come out of our mouth. Are the words that you say, are they perverse? Are they encouraging or are they negative? And sometimes we have to watch what we say but oftentimes, what we say comes from what we hear. I talk about this with my kids all the time at, at high school, is that they're constantly bombarded by language that's just dirty and filthy. And they're like, that is so hard at times. But, but we have to really do our best to watch what we hear, some of the stories that we hear. We have to watch the songs we listen to. Sometimes we have to watch the friendships that we're around because those friendships they talk in a way that's not pleasing and honoring to God. They, they gossip or they're negative or they say things that are just not appropriate. Now, some of us will say things like, yeah, you know what? I know I'm in an environment. I'm in an atmosphere where things are, are not good and clean, but I'm okay because I'm stronger than that. Like maybe for a weaker person, this is more difficult. But for me, I'm okay because I can withstand that. But that is not true. Because what is being said will eventually come into our heart and what's in our heart will eventually come out. Maybe underneath our breath. Maybe in a car where we're driving somewhere. Maybe when we're being squeezed. Whatever is inside of us will eventually come out. We have to watch what we hear and what we say. And then secondarily, we have to watch what we see. What we see, he says in verse 25, he says, look your eyes, look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Why? What's directly before us? God and God's plan is directly before us. And our gaze has to be fixed upon God. He's directing us. So because of that, we have to protect our eyes. And Solomon says, watch where you look because it affects your heart. The truth is there's things in our life that we probably shouldn't look at. When it comes to Netflix, when it comes to movies, there are certain movies and, and shows that we shouldn't watch. When it comes to social media, there are certain things on Facebook and Instagram that if we continually look at it, it brings us down the wrong path. And maybe it isn't, isn't necessarily a dirty thing or, or a sexual thing, but, but maybe it's something where we're looking at what somebody else has and we begin to see that and we begin to lust and have envy at what they have and we desire that and it brings us down the wrong path. You see, we have to watch our eyes. We have to watch our eyes. I love this, this saying of, of garbage in, garbage out. Whatever's coming in is going to be embedded into our hearts. And so therefore it will eventually make its way out. So where do you want to end up in life? Do you want to end up on God's path and God's plan for your life? Then you've got to look straight toward that and keep your eyes fixed on that. He says what we say, what we hear, what we see, and then, and then we, the next one is this is where we go. Where we go, he says in verse 26, he says, give careful thought to the paths 
for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left, but keep your, keep your foot from evil. The truth is, as adults, as high schoolers, as middle schoolers, as kids, there are places that we probably just should never go. There are certain parties that we should not be a part of. There are certain uh, conversations that we should stay away from. There are certain crowds of people that we know that we should not be around because if we're around them, it takes our heart down the wrong path. I had this couple tell us recently this, that they were going to go on vacation with some of their friends, but they knew that if they were going to go on vacation with them, that, that there was going to be over drinking, too much drinking. There was going to be conversations that weren't, weren't holy and, and godly. They, they were going to be rude and even sensual in nature. And they knew that if they were going to go on vacation with their friends, that their heart was going to be pulled away from God instead of being brought closer to God. And so they made a decision. We can't do that. We can't go to that place. We can't put ourselves in a place where we're going to be pulled away from God. So here's a question for all of us. is like, what environments do we put ourselves into on a daily basis? Like, what we're hearing, what we're saying, what we're seeing, where we're going, are those things bringing us closer to God or our hearts further away from God? so huge. We've got to protect ourselves. We've got to guard ourselves. We've got to protect ourselves. A couple of weeks ago, I was telling you we were at kids camp, and so we were at kids camp, and we were playing this game. The leaders and the kids were playing capture the flag, and I don't know if you know what capture the flag is, it's, but it's when your team has its flag, and the other team has its own flag, and the goal is to run across and get their flag and bring it across the line, and if you do that without being tagged, then you win the game. And so we're playing capture the flag. And so I, it was the leaders and the kids, and then there was leaders and kids on the other side. And so I wanted to make sure that we won. And so I, I decided to play defense, like defend the base. It's mainly because I didn't want to run. But, but I'm telling that it was more because I wanted us to win. And so um, I'm guarding the base, and then all of a sudden, Brody comes. Sneaky Brody. Can you guys pray for Brody? <laughs> Brody might be sitting somewhere over here, so you can just pray for him right now. Uh, it's probably super embarrassed, but Brody's a sneakster, okay? Let me tell you a little bit about Brody. This week, um, we were having our anniversary, my wife and I, 20 years anniversary, and we, we went and spent uh, some time downtown. Well, Brody and his friend Brian, they decide to come out at night when we weren't outside, and there goes the lights. Um, was that you, Brody? Um, anyways. <laughs> So he decided to come at night when we were uh, sleeping, and this is what they did to my wife and I's car right here. I just want you guys to see this, okay? Like, honk, we're married, just married. I just think it's a little sneaky. So I'm just trying to give you the character of Brody here, okay? And so Brody is a counselor, and so back to the game. So we're playing. Do you have the next picture of Brody? I just want, I just want everybody to see. This is the guy here, okay? I, I, I'm not trying to point anybody out, but just maybe watch your kids around this guy, okay? Okay. Um, Anyway, no, Brody is awesome. But so he, he walks up and, and he runs to our base and, and he grabs a flag, but I'm not paying attention. I'm not on guard like I'm supposed to be on guard. And so Brody starts to run to his line, but he has a step on me, okay? And so Brody starts to run, but I'm thinking, ah, oh, no, you don't. You don't come into my house and steal the plunger with the flag on it and take it to the other side without me coming after you. So I began to chase Brody with all my 41-year-old might, and I began to run and run and run, and I'm like evading, popping through, pushing over third through fifth graders because this is serious. I know it's their camp, but whatever. And so I'm trying to get to Brody, and I'm about ready to get to Brody, and I reach out to Brody, and Brody, Brody he's a sneakster, but he's, but he's like serious. And so he lays it all out. He jumps over the line, and I miss him. He crosses the line, and we lose, and they won. And right at that moment, I just lost the respect of 40, third through fifth graders <laughs> as their pastor, okay? Now, this is serious stuff. Now, Brody's a great guy, but here's the reality, and this is what I want us to get out of this, is that we have to guard our hearts. Because Satan, he's on, a, he's on an attack, and he's coming after us. 
And if we're not careful, he will infiltrate our base. And he'll take our heart. And when he takes our heart, we begin to lose. And so Solomon is trying to, really trying to get us to understand, you've got to protect your heart. Now, that was defensive. Like, watch what you say. Watch what you hear. Watch where you see. Watch where you go. That's more of that defensive, that defensive stance, and that's what we have to do at times. But, but in sports, some of the best defense is the best offense. Is good offense. And so I don't believe that God just wants us to stand around and just defend ourselves all the time. He's given us some things that we are to do that I think ultimately affects our heart. And some of those things we talk about here at Stonehill Church, it's our partnership pathway. It's the four G's. And I believe when we start doing these four G's as Christ followers, that God begins to do something great in our hearts. Like the first one is gather. That's what you're doing right now. When you come and you gather together on a Sunday morning and you hear God's word and you sing and you talk to one another and you serve one another, there's something about that that warms our hearts. Same thing's true in community groups. When we're in community groups, we get together and it warms our hearts. We gather. We also grow. You see, we can't just leave it up to the church to feed us. We have to feed ourselves. We have to be self-feeders and we have to go home on a daily basis and open up God's word and begin to pray and begin to read his, his word and let God warm our hearts through that. See, we gather, we grow, and then we give. There's something about giving that does something powerful to our hearts. Whether it's our time, whether it's our treasure, whether it's our talent. Something about when we, when we give of our finances to the Lord's work that he does something in, in our hearts where your treasure is, your heart is. There's something about serving when we use our gifts for the Lord, and, and we encourage you to attend one and serve one service here, attend one service, serve at one service, and use your gifts as we serve the body of Christ. There's something about when we serve one another, it's Jesus exampled that for us. He was the ultimate servant, and it warms our heart. We gather, we grow, we give, and then finally we go. We don't just stay here, but we go out into our community and we serve our community. This, that's why we're doing tools for schools. That's why we encourage you as individuals to serve the people that are around you every single day. And not just going is not just that, but it's also the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus says, go and make disciples. We're called to go and begin to reproduce ourselves, encouraging others to follow Christ as well and help them in their walk. And I believe this is that when we start to do these things, we, we have the defensive posture but we also are on the offense, and we're doing what we're called to do. God begins to warm our hearts. And when he warms our hearts, it's more moldable. And he begins to shape it into what he wants us to be. You see, we have to do these things. Now, I want to be really careful because when I talk about doing things, what I'm not talking about is behavior modification, where we do these certain things and we're made right in the sight of God. That's not what I'm talking about. That's what the, the religious leaders, that's what the Pharisees did during Jesus' time. And he, and he pushed against that and said, it's not just about doing these things. It's about having the right heart. And what happens is when we have the right heart and we allow God through the Holy Spirit to come in and penetrate it and begin to move in our hearts, then we start to do those things because we want to, because we love God and we want to serve him. You see, we have to protect our hearts we have to guard it, we have to prioritize it, we have to protect it, and then it moves into this. When we do those things, we have to understand the potential of our hearts. The potential of our hearts. He says, above all else, guard your heart. Why? Because everything you do flows from it. Every single thing you do flows from it. You see, our hearts have so much potential to do good and to do bad. If we're not careful, our hearts can do a lot of damage, do a lot of negative things. But on the flip side, if we allow God to come in and take over, our hearts can do so much good. For everything you do, it flows from it. You see, when our heart is in tune with God's heart, when our heart is in love with God's heart, it affects everything. It affects your relationship with your children. It affects your relationship with your parents. It affects your relationship with your friendships, your coworkers, your neighbors. When your heart is in tune with God, he can use it and he can do something great through you. It has so much potential, so much potential. 
I want to show you a video. There's a guy named Phil. He's been going to our church for a year. It just I've known him for about a year now, and it's been amazing to see God moving in his heart. And so I want you to check this video out. So growing up, uh, church was more of a social event for my family than a relationship. So it was uh, this, the inconsistency in my family um, in their faith really created a roadblock uh, for me in building my relationship with God. Um, and since then, it has really created some challenges uh, for me throughout my life and, and created some bad decisions and, and caused me to to not move forward in my relationship with God. So I've always felt that God was with me, but I never took those steps towards Him. Um, and about 10 months ago, my wife approached me about um, finding a church. So I told her that I was going to join her. So we found Stone Hill. Um, I started asking a lot of questions, um, conversations with my wife, we got involved with the community group, lots of discussions, and I, and I started feeling myself moving you know, more and more to, uh, towards God, and, and that's really when my, my real journey um, began. So as I started stepping towards God, um, it's some of the decisions in my life um, started to, to surface and I started um, having you know, lots of, of, of emotions and guilt and shame and, and I began to feel that I really needed, I really needed peace, I really needed healing, I needed forgiveness. So on a business trip, on a plane 30,000 feet up in the air one day, I just felt the Holy Spirit uh, come over me. Yeah, it's like nothing I've ever experienced, and I just heard heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and, and said, it's time, it's time for you to, to come to me. And uh, right then and there on the plane with all these strangers, I you know, accepted Jesus as my Savior and, and um, accepted God um, into my heart and accepted His forgiveness for all of my sins. Um, it was it was very overwhelming and emotional. And I just in that moment I felt um, all that pain and all those chains of of all that shame and, and guilt just just melt off of me. And he he lifted all of that from me in that moment. Um, and it was a it was just an amazing experience. So now that I've given my life to Christ, I'm excited to get baptized. You know, to start my, my new relationship with God and, and to honor Him and to be the spiritual leader to my family that I've always wanted to be. Hi, my name is Phil. This is my story. This is your story. And this is our story. Yeah, that's so cool. We, we talked about that at the very beginning. We believe that Jesus changes lives. And that's why we do what we do. And I cannot wait to see Phil's story continue because this is just the beginning, the start. I cannot wait to see how it trickles down in, in his family and how he leaves a legacy because he surrendered his heart to the Lord. And it's amazing. Solomon says, look, we got to guard it. We've got to protect it. It is priority. We have to make sure that we put it above all else. Top priority to guard our heart because every single thing flows from it. Our legacy flows from it. Our relationships flow from it. Every single thing that we do and everywhere that God wants to take us starts in our hearts. How's your heart? we pray together right now. God, we're just so grateful for all that you've done. Lord, I love you, and, I, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak about our hearts. And I don't know where everyone's at today, but God, you know where we are. And so I just ask, God, that you would open and soften our hearts right now. 
with every head bowed and eyes are closed, the lights are going to come down a little bit here. I just, I want to ask you a question. Maybe you're here today and, and you're thinking about your own heart. You're a Christian, you're a Christ follower, um, but, but there's something struggling in your heart. There's, there's an issue going on right now. It might be something that someone else did to you and it hurt you and you're struggling with it. Maybe there's some hurt, there's some, there's some bitterness, there's unforgiveness there. And maybe there's something in your heart you're dealing with and it's something else entirely. It's something that you've been looking at or people that you've been around or, or there's something that's just not settled in your heart. And as I speak this morning, you are struggling with it. The Holy Spirit's moving in your heart and you say, you know, Doug, I'm struggling just a little bit. Well, no one's looking. If you're like that, say, Doug, will you pray for me? Just slip up your hand and say, there's something going on in my heart right now. Come on, just lift up your hands, several bunch of you guys this morning a lot of us we have unsettled hearts put your hand down let me let me pray for you God and for those who just raised their hand Lord we don't know exactly what's happening but you know and so I just pray that you would be with them that if there's something they need to confess they would confess if it's something that they need to let go they would let go but God you would just move and help them to make that decision God warm their heart right now to make that decision Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed maybe you were here this morning, you've gone to church for a long time, or maybe this is your first time at going to church, but you've never done what Phil did on the story, on the video, where he, he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. He was up in an airplane, and finally God said, it's time, and he's like, okay. And maybe you're sitting here today, and God is saying the same thing to you in your heart, saying, you need to accept me. You've never given your life to me. You've never surrendered your life to me. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners, we're all messy, but, but God gave his son, Jesus Christ, to make us right before God. But we have to accept that free gift of salvation. We have to give our life to Jesus. And maybe you've never done that before. You've never given your life to Jesus before. But this morning, you know there's something turning in your heart, in your life, and you need to surrender your life to Jesus. While nobody's looking, if you're here this morning and you want to give your life to Jesus and never have done that before, just slip up your hand real quick. No one's looking. Just slip up real strong. There's one. Anybody else? There's two back there. Anybody else? Three. Anybody else that wants to receive Christ this morning? Three people. You put your hands down. You just raise your hand while no one's looking. This is what I would love for you to do is I want you to pray this prayer with me if you want to give your life to Christ. And the prayer isn't magical. It's more about the heart, right? It's, we just talked about this. It's about a life change and giving your life and your heart to Christ. So you can pray this with me right where you're seated. God, I know that I'm a sinner. And God, this morning I ask for your forgiveness. God, I know that you, you gave your son Jesus to die for me. And that he gave his life and he was buried and he died and he rose again so that I could have eternal life, so that I could have a relationship with you. So this morning, I surrender my life to you and I make you Lord of my life. In Jesus' name.